This week on the Back Table Podcast. Elimination of caffeine means elimination of caffeine. You can't just say, well, I'm just going to drink my coffee. That's okay. And then and, and I'm like, well, are you sleeping at a regular schedule? Well, I still take naps in the afternoon. That's not good. You got it. Like you got to stick with it, with the program sort of, it's not an a la carte menu. It's a prefix menu. You got to do everything that's on there. If you pick and choose, you're not going to get better because we don't know if the ones that you're not choosing are your potential triggers. So we have to like concentrate on the things. Now, the ones that we have the most difficulty with are the ones who have a major stressor in their life. Most commonly, it's it's a spouse or a parent that is ill or a child that they have to take care of. That's that's a major source of stress that they kind of live with every single day. Those are the ones that are most difficult, I should say. The patients, the others are untreated sleep apnea. And so those, that's why if, if somebody's not getting better with like medication, we will send them for a sleep study. Even if they say that they don't, they don't feel they have it, I still will check it just to be sure. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with the hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. This episode is hosted by Dr. Walter Kutz. I'd like to welcome Dr. Hamid Dejillian to the Backtable ENT podcast. This is actually Hamid's second time on the podcast. He joined us on episode 60, where we discuss otologic manifestations of migraines. If you've not listened to that episode, I highly encourage you to take a listen. As a matter of fact, I've shared this episode with many of my patients who really appreciate the discussion, and they've really gleaned a lot of things they can use uh, to help them treat their facilitator migraine. So I really appreciate that episode of me. Dr. Jillian is a professor of otolaryngology at UC Irvine. He has published extensively on how migraines affect otologic conditions, and more recently is focused on the treatment of tinnitus, which is challenging for us to say the least. I hope you take away a better understanding of the current thoughts about the pathophysiology of tinnitus and new promising treatment options. Welcome, Amit. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate you making the time for me. I would also encourage uh, others to listen to the previous one because we we may not go as extensively into some of the, the dietary and lifestyle changes that migraine treatment requires, but I'll do as best as I can to try to get as much of that into this episode as well. Yeah, great. No, it's a, it's a really great episode. And like I said, I, I think physicians will learn a lot and patients will learn a lot from that episode. So highly encourage listening to that. So what sparked your interest in tinnitus research? This is a, I see patients with tinnitus find it very challenging. I think the traditional treatment options, while there's some present, it's very limiting. So certainly we did a lot of work in tinnitus. So what has sparked your interest and what, what news going on in your lab? Sure. Yeah. So when I was in residency, you know, I thought to myself, I was at the VA hospital. It was my first rotation on otolaryngology. And I thought to myself, there are so many people with tinnitus and we really have nothing to offer these people. And, you know, at the time, the sound therapy concept was explained to me as, well, we're just giving them a different sound to cover up the sound that they're hearing. So, but they're still listening to a sound. So it's, it's still, I mean, it may be less annoying, but it's not a treatment per se. It's just masking the problem. So I sort of went on this quest to try to figure out what causes it and, and what could be done about it. And I must say, you know, I tried a lot of different things and I first tried to read everything there is that had been written about it. I tried to actually do a randomized clinical trial in residency using Paxil, which at the time was a new antidepressant. But uh, unfortunately, because of my limited research time and, and the fact that recruitment takes a long time for these things, I couldn't finish the trial. But it sort of remained as an interest for me for a long time. And then I sort of took a renewed interest when I came to UC Irvine about 18 years ago, when I started talking to one of my colleagues, um, who's a hearing researcher, and I said, hey, you know, we, we need to like come up with something for this. We know that cochlear implants work. Maybe we need to do something different for people with hearing. And that sort of sparked this sort of journey that then in the process of trying to figure out another way of treating tinnitus, I sort of figured out that there is something else going on in tinnitus that we didn't realize before. And that's sort of what sort of sparked this new area of research that I've been doing sort of clinically. What do you see as kind of the newest thought on the pathophysiology of tinnitus? Yeah. So traditionally, you know, pathophysiology of tinnitus has been explained as, well, you have loss of cells in the inner ear or the loss of the synapses between the, the hair cells and the auditory nerve. 
However, that can explain the fact that there is an increase in the what's so-called spontaneous firing rate in the central auditory system. Now, when we actually think about this is you think about, well, what's happening in a person who, let's say, was 49 years old, had the same degree of hearing loss as they've had for the last couple of years, and then suddenly they turn 50, let's say, and then their tinnitus you know, becomes either loud or becomes noticeable. There must be something that's changed. And this can't be something that's just the spontaneous firing rate just went from nothing to a whole lot in that span of time. Or the people who say, you know, I have tinnitus that comes and goes. I have it some days and it's really bad. And then I have some days it's completely quiet. If that spontaneous firing rate is there, it's probably not coming and going. And then you have this other category of patients who say that I've had this tinnitus for a long time. It was very quiet and I didn't notice it most of the time. It was not bothersome. And then it just, after this sudden event, usually they have some kind of event they'll notice or something, it became very loud and it stayed loud. And the traditional pathophysiology really doesn't explain that. And so then as I was you know, what I try to do is, as we talked in that sort of previous episode, when I when I have a problem that I can't figure out, I try to basically ask more and more questions of patients and sort of try to figure out what makes it better and what makes it worse and to see if there's a common pattern in these things. And as much as I sort of probably at the initial onset, you know, when I started my practice, I said, oh, you know, I don't want to see patients with tinnitus because really I didn't have a solution for them. But then I thought, if I want to figure this out, I actually have to see patients and talk to them and figure out their stories and see if there's a common pattern. And over time, I was able to figure out that there is a common pattern of what triggers the tinnitus to become worse. And that's sort of tied in with the migraine research that I was doing related to how it causes vertigo and whatnot. And I realized a lot of the triggers that people are talking about, stress, poor sleep, caffeine, wine, you know, et cetera, those are the same ones that trigger regular uh, migraine headache and or a vestibular migraine attack. So that's sort of what made, made me think, I wonder if there's a connection between tinnitus and migraine. So then we actually started treating the patients with these fluctuations of tinnitus or the ones that suddenly increased as migraine. And that sort of uh, has evolved into what we're doing now. I have the same challenge. You know, you, you'll see a patient with tinnitus and and it's a very frustrating condition, and I agree that the, the treatments are limited. We basically will have our audiologist meet with them and try hearing aid, a masking hearing aid, some sort of tinnitus retraining therapy, which can be helpful, but, you know, we do need better treatments. Do you think part of the challenge with the randomized control trials and the trials on tinnitus is the, just such a high placebo effect and the fluctuation in tinnitus? And you know, why haven't we been able to find either a, a medication or supplement uh, that has been shown to treat tinnitus on a randomized trial? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think there is definitely a placebo effect. And part of it is because tinnitus gets worse with this, uh, as I said, this migraine-related process. These are people who don't necessarily get headaches. Um, Some of them do, but a lot of them don't get headaches. And the only manifestation of the migraine is this this increase in the level of tinnitus. And I think what we were doing before in, in a lot of trials is we're just packing all the same types of patients into the same trial. And I've made that mistake myself. But now that we've kind of have a much better understanding, our sort of current trials, we are looking specifically for people with fluctuating tinnitus and the ones that change the levels or intermittent tinnitus. And what I think the, that that's one of the challenges. So you have a placebo effect. The second, you have a sort of a heterogeneous population and you know, I think that's sort of been the main issues that we've had in our trials in that if you have this heterogeneous population, even if let's say, I don't know, 40% of the patients have a significant benefit because the placebo effect is pretty high, you then actually, that will kind of look like there was really no significant effect. But then when we actually look at the individual group and say, hey, looks like this group had a big benefit. You know, what's characteristic about these patients that the other ones didn't have? then I think we can sort of parse it out. I think supplements, you know, there's, as you know, you bring up supplements, so supplements, there's kind of unfortunately a a completely unregulated market, but we have actually now figured out that there are a few supplements related to migraine that do have an effect. 
So, you know, there is a lot of kind of mixed supplements on the market, which look somewhat similar in terms of what, what they have in them. But we do use supplements, and I can get into it a little bit more, but not the traditional kind of ones that you get that are mixed for tinnitus. Um, these are just things that people will buy individually. And those are supplements that are involved with migraine. And some people who really have a deficiency in those with chronic migraine, which some of these people do, then they do get a benefit from them. What do, what are those supplements? Maybe, you know, just a, kind of an overview. Sure, yeah. So th in general, the, the, the ones that we use, there are sort of three primary ones that we use. We use magnesium, vitamin B2 or riboflavin, coenzyme Q10. Um, those three have been shown to be low in people with chronic migraine. We also use sometimes, depending on the patient, vitamin D as well, because vitamin D, a low vitamin D is associated with increased chronic migraine. So whether there is a therapeutic effect or not, we don't know. Uh, there's definitely an association and vitamin D is a pretty benign supplement to take. So we, we do use that as well. Yeah. So do you, some of this work may be somewhat early or your observations are early. Do you, do you feel that like the same sort of supplement you know, migraine diet, controlling sleep. Have you found it effective for the other subset of patients that have continuous tinnitus? Yeah, a good question. Um, you know, so what I do with the continuous patients is if they say that the tinnitus is very loud and bothersome to them, then yes, there is an eff effect with that. But if they say that, well, the tinnitus is there, most of the day I don't notice it, I only notice it at night, those are the patients that really will not benefit from this regimen they would be better off using something like generic sound, you know, like a white noise machine or an app or something, or a customized sound that's sort of directed for the tinnitus. But if people are most of the time not bothered by it, I would rather them using something free, like a, an app or something that they could use at night on a sleep timer or something like that, and that would be enough for what they need. But the ones who say, this is driving me crazy and it's always at the same level. Yes, those people we do, we're able to bring the volume down for them. Yeah, I don't know, because I don't know how much I've asked in the past about tinnitus fluctuation. You know, I think that's a, again, you know, you talk to, you have to talk to many, many patients and we sort of start picking up on, on patterns such as that. So that's interesting, something I'll certainly ask my patients and, you know, consider more of a migraine type of approach. You know, a lot of patients really like that approach, you know. Most of our patients actually don't want medication. They'd rather have something that's a supplement or a dietary approach, working their sleep, as challenging as that is. But I, that's, you know, ever since, you know, you know, I've talked about that, I've been implement, implementing that more for vestibular migraines. A lot of patients are like, hey, I love trying to fix this without medication. So it's a, like a great approach. Also, to ask them more about more of the fluctuation in their hearing. I also think that, you know, even similar with, I guess you have to differentiate that similar with continuous tinnitus. If they get a poor night's sleep, they have something occur in their life, you know, that's very stressful, they're going to also worsen too. So I guess it can be somewhat challenging to differentiate the ones that may be more of a migraine phenomenon from other reasons. Correct. Yeah. So I usually ask them, you know, is there a change in the volume to the tinnitus on sort of a day-to-day -day basis? And what I specifically ask them is, you know, have you had a day in the last couple of months where the tinnitus was low? And you're like, oh my God, this is so good. If I could just stay at this quiet level, I would be very happy. And if those are the ones that they most of the time have an active migraine process. And then there's just a little break in the migraine and the tinnitus drops. And then it just goes back up again. And so then those are the ones that we would benefit. Now, if somebody says that it started loud and it's been loud for 30 years, then probably not, not going to be a good candidate for this treatment regimen. But, you know, the more you actually ask patients, the more you'll find out that there are a lot of people who actually have the fluctuation. And most of them would be very happy if we could just bring their level down to the, the baseline level. Now, I tell them up front, this is not intended to cure tinnitus. It's not going to completely silence it. But it's going to bring the level down to sort of the lowest level that you generally hear or a level that generally doesn't bother you during the day when there is noise around you and you will only notice it at night. And people say, yeah, I'll be very happy with that. But I want to make sure that their expectations are in line with our expectations because that's the only way to kind of make patients unhappy is set very high expectations and then not be able to deliver. And then we do occasionally have patients that are very early in the onset of it. I think there is something that happens in the brain and I'm not sure what that is and we're trying to figure that out. But there is something that happens that 
takes them from an acute stage to a con chronic stage. I think in the acute stage, we actually have been able to reverse the tinnitus and completely stop it in some patients. But that's usually in the first couple of weeks. But if it's been going on for like usually after three, six months, then we generally can't make it go away. We could just bring the volume down. So there's something that happens. It's thought to be something related to the so-called salient center in the brain. But whatever it is, there's something that does change at some point. What that point is, we don't know yet. We actually want to do a trial on acute tinnitus where we see you know, how many people and what's the stage at which we could potentially stop tinnitus and what's the stage at which we can't stop it anymore. We could just bring the volume down. So that's something that we're planning on doing in the next few months. So, you know, one thing when I send a patient to neurology thinking they may have some migraine, could be a severe migraine or some other otologic symptom cause of migraines, a lot of times you get pushed back. They don't, they don't fit to the severe migraine criteria exactly. It's a very detailed criteria and, oh, they don't qualify because they missed this one checkbox. So I guess global, just a, overall, do patients have to have a history of headache? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that's sort of, I think, the what's been sort of the biggest obstacle for patients who have this so-called atypical migraine or otologic migraine, as we call it, in getting proper treatment is because everyone is so focused on the criteria. And if they don't, you know, fill all the checkboxes of five episodes and between this number of minutes and this many hours, et cetera, then, you know, it's not migraine. So the problem with that is that, you know, I usually t tell people, you know, those criteria were not written by God. These are written by people and people change their minds. It's just that it takes time, you know, from the time something is discovered until it's implemented by half the physicians is 17 years. So it takes time for people to catch on and say, okay, well, maybe there is actually evidence that there is something other than just these criteria. Now, I think the criteria are important for if you're someone who's doing a study on, let's say, migraine headaches, you need to have strict criteria. But if you're looking at this sort of atypical form of migraine and how it affects the ear and things like tinnitus and dizziness, et cetera, then we need to be a little bit more flexible. And I think because when we look at these patients, we've actually done studies on multiple groups of patients with various conditions to look at their whether they fulfill the criteria and how short of the criteria were they. And when we look at there's, you know, about maybe half the people fulfill the migraine criteria and then another maybe, you know, 15 to 20 some percent will fulfill four, you know, headaches and not five. And then there, there's like a, a few, maybe about another 20 some percent that's like they fulfill three out of the five criteria. And then we have, you know, then a very small percentage left that actually doesn't fulfill any of the criteria. So most of the patients have, you know, these criteria. So if you think about, you know, if I have had four migraine headaches in my life, I technically can't be diagnosed with a migraine diagnosis when in fact, I, you know, what's to say that at, at one, it wasn't migraine because, you know, how did I get the first one? You know, and it just depends on where you're catching people. You catch people at, towards the end of the life, then maybe you'll get all five of them. But, you know, it, unless someone has a very, a very recurrent basis, you know, they, you won't see it. But a lot of people, especially men we see, have atypical symptoms. And these atypical symptoms most commonly are stiffness of the neck, sort of the stiffness of the neck muscles, which we've often found to be on the same side as the tinnitus, and or sinus pressure, ear pressure, sometimes just sound sensitivity or hyperacusis. So a lot of hyperacusis is related to migraine as well. And so these patients oftentimes have these atypical symptoms and say, well, I don't get headaches. You know, I just get this head pressure or I just get this neck stiffness. That's not, that's not a migraine. And, you know, and so I try to explain to them, well, no, this actually is a migraine. And it's just a different form of it. And it's so common that, you know, my resident will go see the patient and they'll come out and they say, well, you know, they have no history of migraine. And then I go in and as soon as I go in there, they say, oh, you know what? I used to get ocular migraine when I was younger. And when I think about it, they think about, they remember that, oh yeah, I do used to get these atypical forms of migraine. You know, when you think about atypical migraine, you know, ocular migraine is not the form of migraine. It doesn't have headaches. Abdominal migraine, which is usually in, sometimes in children or so the cyclic vomiting, or in adults in the form of IBS and stuff, those don't have headaches associated with them necessarily. So you can get other forms of migraine that do not have headaches. So migraine is not synonymous with headache. Migraine is a central sensitivity. It's basically a brain sensitivity condition that causes various symptoms depending on what is all involved. It's a lot of times through the trigeminal nerve, but it could be through other nerves. You know, As I said, you could get abdominal symptoms. That's not the trigeminal nerve but it's all, you know, directed by the brain. Yeah, that, that's, that's excellent. It's a really great explanation. 
So let's say you diagnose a patient with this fluctuating tinnitus, and then you determine, hey, there's, I want to treat this as a, a migraine phenomenon. For the listeners, what is your algorithm? How do you how do you treat them? What's your goal of treatment? Sure. So I usually will start naming off the the triggers. The primary sort of five primary triggers are stress, poor sleep. I usually kind of pause at sleep and I say, how is your sleep at night? And you know, as you will, you know, you've probably experienced very frequently, people will say, my sleep is terrible. And or if they are a little bit overweight, or if I'm looking in their mouth and and they're you know they have a kind of a crowded pharynx. I will ask them about snoring, and then I'll actually get a sleep study on them oftentimes because it is very common that people have undiagnosed sleep apnea uh, or the sleep apnea sort of starts that triggers this migraine, which then triggers the tinnitus to suddenly become loud. And treating the sleep apnea will help. So sleep is a very critical component of this. People who get daily symptoms have daily triggers. It's usually a, a major stressor or it's like a daily sort of sleep problem, or it's a daily dietary item. We'll get through the other one. So stress, sleep. Next is diet. I tell them that diet has three components to it. Dehydration is a major trigger. So I tell them they need to drink at least two liters of water. I ask them to eat on time. Don't skip meals. I've had several patients whose tinnitus started with intermittent fasting or it got worse at with intermittent fasting. And just correcting that fixed the problem for them. The third is then the diet itself. Now, you know, as we were talking before, because the the heterogeneous population and whatnot, there are a lot of studies and the sort of the purists will say, there are no studies that show caffeine makes migraine worse. There's no studies that show, let's say chocolate or, you know, wine or whatever makes migraine worse. But the reality is it's actually, it's not everyone sensitive to every one of these food items. And these food items are not sometimes individually a problem, but when combined with other things. So, you know, for example, I tell patients, if you're on vacation, you're relaxed, you're getting great sleep, you know, you can probably have wine and you're not going to get any symptoms. But if your stress is high and your sleep has been poor and you drink the same wine, you're going to get over the threshold and you will get your symptoms. So we have to sort of tell them that while the diet's important, it's, it is a multifactorial phenomenon. The diet is difficult to do. I definitely would admit to that myself as a migraine sufferer, but I will tell you that what I generally do nowadays is I tell patients, I want you to focus on the foods that you eat on a daily basis first. So, and most commonly those are caffeine. And I do recommend complete elimination of caffeine, not even decaf coffee because that has caffeine in it. Second is protein bars and protein shakes are very high in tyramine. They tend to be something people drink a lot or eat a lot on a daily basis. And then the third is wine, which some people tend to drink on a daily basis or, or beer, which is also high in tyramine. So, and then I tell them about fast food and prepackaged ready to eat foods that, that are savory, that have MSG in them. And then sort of, those are sort of the ones I tell them to concentrate on. And then with the intermittent tinnitus or the fluctuating ones, I tell them to concentrate on the six hours before your tinnitus got loud to see what happened in that six hours that made your tinnitus louder. And that's when I want you to drill down on the diet. And then the next sort of trigger we talk about is hormonal changes. Hormonal changes uh, mostly affect women, of course, but uh, in men, I have seen it as with testosterone supplementation, where actually stopping the testosterone supplement actually improved the tinnitus. So, you know, those are just some things that, you know, in women, we can't do much about the, the hormone fluctuation, but we try to fix everything else around it so that we can limit the impact of the hormonal changes. And then finally, it's overstimulation. And overstimulation most commonly for tinnitus, what makes tinnitus loud is loud sounds. So a lot of people will say, I go to a loud restaurant and I go home, the tinnitus is blasting. And then the next day it settles down. Or a lot of patients will associate it with atmospheric pressure changes. So they say after an airplane flight, it gets loud. Or there is a thunderstorm or right before a thunderstorm, my tinnitus gets louder. And then I tell them about other things like very intense exercise, getting overheated, Sometimes people are sensitive to light or motion. I've had patients who play video games and after they playing the video games, their tinnitus gets louder is because of the, the visual overstimulation. So I tell them to just do it. They're aware of it. I don't tell them to like avoid noise and things like that. I mean, if you're going to go to a concert, I tell them wear earplugs, of course. But if they're going to be in an environment where they have noticed that that is going to potentially trigger them, then they need to limit their exposure, at least uh, to, to shorter time periods. 
Yeah, that's that fantastic. I know that you have a uh, your clinic set up with you have a lot of handouts. You have algorithms. You work with APPs that are versed at this, so you can really have a practice really treat many patients. For those of us out out there that may not have those resources, we just haven't put that together for migraine associated conditions or tennis like we're talking about. What's some good resources that can be used um, to help us learn more about these triggers, and maybe we can even suggest these to the patients. Sure. You know, there is a, a organization I've uh, been a part of from the sort of founding is called Migraine and Otolaryngology Society, Bas- basically started by a group of otolaryngologists and some other specialties who are interested in the manifestations of migraine in otolaryngology. Also, the Association for Migraine Disorders, also started by Rick Godley, who was intimately involved in the Migraine and Otolaryngology Society uh, founding. And there are a lot of good resources there, including some free CMEs on AMD website that people can do that sure can teach them some of this stuff. And I should mention also that in addition, we do use medications. So it's not just lifestyle and dietary changes. We do have to use medications in some people. There's a little bit of sort of nuance to that. The AMD website has some resources for physicians as well. I actually, because we've had some success with this, We've had a lot of patients from out of state who have been contacting us who want to you know, see me, but because of state licensing, I can't really see and prescribe medications across state borders. So I've actually partnered with a telemedicine clinic that has people who have licenses in multiple states, and they're, they've been actually implementing this treatment across the country now. So there are, you know, if, if people are comfortable doing the lifestyle dietary changes and stuff and, you know, the medications, you know, great. If not, there are other resources out there for them too. Yeah, on the, on the patients that, well, look, get, getting back to that, so um, you know, I've, I've recommended patients read books like Heal Your Headache by Dr. Buckholtz, and I've read through that book. I think it's very helpful just to give them something. If the right patient wants to wants to read a lot about this, and instead of Dr. Google, we give them a good resource. But, um, you know, even me reading through that, and I had a patient that was having severe migraines. He's about, I don't know, a 50-year-old gentleman, no problems before, and I asked him, got more detail about what had gone on, what he had changed. And he went on a low carb diet and he was eating a lot of nuts every day. And I said, well, that, you know, that's, that's a migraine trigger. And he, so I had no idea. And so he stopped that and he was better within a few weeks. And so I think really familiarizing yourself with these triggers and, and really is an easy way to help a patient out. And, you know, this, he changed uh, his diet and that all improved. So I think books like Heal Your Headache, these resources you discuss are important for us and the patients. So what do you, you know, now and you're treating patients, um, these patients with tinnitus, probably related to a migraine phenomenon. What percent of patients do you think improve enough that you're able to get their tinnitus down to a level that they're, hey, I still have the tinnitus, but you know, I'm, I can live like this and I'm much, much happier. Sure. Yeah. We first start with the lifestyle dietary uh, modifications. And usually the sort of, from what we have looked at on our data, probably somewhere in the 40 to 50% will just improve with just that. But they do really have to follow it. And as you said, I did, didn't did mention histamine as a trigger, dietary trigger, and that's what it's what's in nuts. But if they really follow it. Now, you know, it's not too uncommon that people come and they say, well, I'm not better. I did everything. And I said, well, are you drinking caffeine? Well, I have my coffee in the morning. Well, I said, you know, elimination of caffeine means elimination of caffeine. You can't just say, well, I'm just going to drink my coffee. That's okay. And then and I'm like, well, are you sleeping at a regular schedule? Well, I still take naps in the afternoon. Well, that that's not... It's not good. You got it. Like you got to stick with it with the program. Sort of. It's not. I tell them it's a. It's not an a la carte menu. It's a prefix menu. You got to do everything that's on there. Uh, you can't get to ch- pick and choose because if you pick and choose, you're not going to get better because we don't know if the ones that you're not choosing are your potential triggers. So we have to like concentrate on the things. Now you know if somebody has the ones that we have the most difficulty with are the ones who have a major stressor in their life. Like most commonly, it's it's a spouse or a parent that is ill or a child that they have to take care of that's that's a major source of stress that they kind of live with every single day. Those are the ones that are most difficult, I should say. The patients, the others are untreated sleep apnea. And so those that's why if, if somebody's not getting better with like medication, we will send them for a sleep study. Even if they say that they don't they don't feel they have it, I still will check it just to be sure. I do use my sleep medicine colleagues a lot for people with insomnia. And using cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is, is a very valuable resource. There is a free app that was produced by the VA system called CBTI Coach that people can use. It's an eight-week program. But there are CBTI practitioners all over the country. 
And so it would be a good resource for patients to work with. Now, if we do everything, meaning lifestyle changes, dietary changes, you know, get the sleep in order, get medications, usually sometimes a couple medicines together, we can get about 85 to 90% of them better. But it requires kind of being flexible and sometimes being creative because patients can get side effects. And so we have to like work around them and sometimes combine medicines that we don't traditionally combine. So for example, we use a, you know, a tricyclic antidepressant, for example, like a norotriptyline, and they get to a certain dose and they get side effects from that. And, but then it's too low a dose. And I really think they need a little higher dose of something. So I'll add something like Paxil to it, for example, and try to get them the effect that we need, sort of the anti-anxiety and anti-migraine effect of that combined together. And then I will add like an anti-seizure to it, you know, like top topiramate or or gabapentin or lamotrigine, things like that. So we have to be creative because patients with migraine are generally very sensitive to medications. Now, you know, I have colleagues who tell me, well, you know, I tried norotropin, it didn't work, you know, and so, I, you know, that's all I can do. And so I, I tell the patient, yeah, I know you tried it, but you got to do the lifestyle and dietary changes and the medication together. When we actually did a study on, this was on the vestibular migraine side, of lifestyle changes and dietary changes plus supplements versus medication. And it was just nortriptyline up to 40 milligrams, which is not as high as we generally go. But we just wanted to see a four-week change. And they were actually pretty equivalent. And when we combined them, they did a lot better. But if if you don't do one without the other, you know, then you're not going to get the maximum benefit. So I really drill down on you know, the diet, the, the stress reduction, the sleep, and then combine that with medicine. And then the medicine, we try to direct towards the issues that they have. So if somebody, let's say, has the sleep onset issue, I'll give them something that makes them a little sleepy so that they get the benefit out of that part of it so that we can give them better quality sleep. And so it's sort of, you have to, as I said, you have to be somewhat creative sometimes. And so some patients, we run out of sort of options and we'll use the newer drugs, the anti-CGRP antibodies, even for them. And we've had some good benefit from those, although... Uh, we don't have a lot of patients in that because we generally can get them better with the other meds. Yeah, I think I'm like many other otologists, otolaryngologists that, you know, we listen to these talks and we read the papers and in our training, you know, I think we really focus on surgery and, and medical management, you know, the basics of diuretics for many years disease and a lot of steroids for different conditions. But you know, I think a lot of it is just getting comfortable prescribing the medications. Because unfortunately, I think I have a similar situation as most of us is that when I need maybe uh, assistance from neurology or other specialties, they may not have quite the understanding or buy-in. And so they're not always going to help, you know, with those medications. So I've been trying to get more and more comfortable with the medications. And it seems like overall, besides a few a few things you need to be careful about, they're pretty safe. And it's interesting that you'll actually combine medications and you obviously need to know about these. And over time, you develop that, but but with good success. One, one of the challenges I run into, a lot of these patients are Seven, over 70 years old, and then I really worry about the medications. Any comments on treating? Because all these patients are going to be, however you want to define older patients, but maybe older than our average patient. Any hints on medications with that patient population? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are some antidepressants that are sort of more recommended in the older population and some that are sort of preferred not to be used because of their either anticholinergic effect or the somnolence that they create. I must say I haven't had that issue. You know, we're, we have our patients send us sort of their, the my chart, the email messages when they have issues. So, and we usually start very low and slowly go up so that we have sort of cushion. And if people get side effects, we just back off on the medicine. And then usually the side effects sort of goes away pretty soon after. I must say we haven't had that issue, but you know, in general, you know, if you, let's say, want to prescribe nortriptyline, to a patient that's over 65, you, you know, in EMR system, you're going to get a warning that this is causes anticholinergic effect, et cetera. But I must say, you know, we've used it pretty frequently. I mean, you know, I, probably that's our number one sort of go-to drug. And we haven't had that issue, you know, but the challenge sometimes is patients who are already on very high dose antidepressants for another reason. So if, you know, they come in on, let's say, Zoloft of 200 milligrams a day, then I won't start with an antidepressant on those patients. Um, we'll usually start with like an anti-seizure or calcium channel blocker or, you know, something like that. So, you know, as I said, it, it's sort of, that's one of the, the difficult parts of, of doing this is you have to kind of do it a little bit and sort of get comfortable with it, as, as you said. And initially, I would actually send our, at least from, I started 
treating migraine primarily for, because of vertigo. And I would send the patients to uh, neurologists and they would say, well, you don't have headaches, therefore you don't have migraine. And then I said, oh, okay, I need to start treating this myself because, you know, there are these patients who are kind of in limbo because they don't have headaches, but they have a migraine related condition that sort of, you know, right now is sort of not, doesn't have wide recognition. So, and I had actually specifically, is this is one patient that started it, is they said, you know, they were on disability. Um, they worked at our university and it was on disability because of dizziness. And they, you know, I, I said, well, you definitely have a migraine problem, but, but they wouldn't treat them. So then I said, okay, I'll start giving you medication. So I started doing it and then I sort of got comfortable with it and I got it, you know, started doing more and more for other patients. And then, you know, as we've talked before, I used the APPs to help me because, you know, these patients do require, you know, multiple visits and they are, uh, you know, there are a lot more patients with dizziness and tinnitus than there are otologists, obviously. And so there are only so many of them we can see. And so we need to, but this is something that with experience, if the, you know, an APP comes, spends time with me, they can sort of learn and then they can sort of, you know, go on and, and sort of do this with sort of under my supervision. And then they will run the more difficult ones where they don't know what to do. They'll run by me and I'll say, okay, we'll do this and do this. And then, you know, we'll see how it goes. And then we'll just do sometimes shorter follow-ups or longer follow-ups, depending on the patient and their comfort and, and how quickly they want to go up. But, but, you know, to, to answer your question is these patients, unfortunately, don't have a good home because right now, you know, the, the people who are most comfortable treating atypical migraine are otologists, but it's probably one of the rarest specialties in, in the entire country. You know, there are only about maybe 300 some people who do this. And that's just not enough to treat, you know, the, the millions of people who have probably fluctuating tinnitus and or dizziness and whatnot. And so we, we need to use other resources. We need to teach other otolaryngologists. And, you know, that's, that's why I partnered with this telemedicine company, because it is something that's teachable. It's just, you know, it requires a lot of time. So I, I put in a lot of time training their people and then they can implement this. And then, you know, this can then be done independently of just my practice, because I have just, just like you, I have to see patients with surgery, you know, I have to train residents in surgery. And so, you know, I can't just see tinnitus or dizziness because there are a lot of other things I need to do. I need to, you know, maintain a skull-based practice and chronic ear practice and cochlear implants and all the other things that we do in order to train our residents. But that's a service we need to do also to help a lot of patients who have this problem. And we can do that with the benefit of other sort of mid-level providers. Yeah. And that's, that's been a change for us for the past few years. We have a, you know, excellent APPs in our clinic and they're very interested in yeah, they don't do surgery, so they're interested in medical management, uh, medical otology, and and you know you meet these patients and they're really struggling, and you know you want to help them as best you can, but you know that you know they're going to need probably follow up initially, maybe every six to eight weeks. You're going to get a lot of messages, and it, it can become overwhelming. And, and like you say, you can only do so much. So I think most practices now have APPs as part of their practice, and and you know these are very intelligent, motivated compassionate individuals. So this has been, it really helped us tremendously. So I appreciate you incorporating that in your practice. And I think that's becoming more common. So I want to take the last few minutes to talk about some of the emerging treatments, you know, with technology, AI, some of the new uh, uh, bimodal neurostimulation devices. There's some other promising treatments for maybe patients that have continuous tinnitus that you know, are not going to respond to migraine treatments. What is your um, understanding of that you know, that, that new um, treatment options that are coming out for patients? Sure. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, um, sort of when we started our, our quest on uh, treating tinnitus or finding a new solution to tinnitus back about 18 years ago at UCI, one of the things I sort of talked about with my colleague, Feng Gang Zhang in our department who's a hearing scientist was, you know, what's a cochlear implant doing? Um, you know, a cochlear implant is basic uh, to silence tinnitus because cochlear implants work, as you know, about 70% of the time and, and making tinnitus go away when they're active, of course. And I thought, you know, there are stimulating neurons um, because uh, sort of for, for the audience, uh, they are when we lose hearing, we're primarily losing um, hair cells in the cochlea. But the neurons actually stay around for a long time, at least uh, 10 to 15 years afterwards, sometimes longer. And they slowly degrade if there is no sound stimulation to the ear but they will otherwise be maintained if especially there is sound uh, stimulation to the ear. So if somebody has, you know, some moderate sensory neural hearing loss, they're still getting sound through the ear. Those neurons are going to stay alive for, you know, for a very long time. Now, is there a way that we can stimulate those neurons without putting an electrode inside the cochlea, which can cause hearing loss? And 
our first sort of foray into this uh, was inspired in, you know, so many things, I think, at least in my sort of uh, research, has been inspired like by a single patient. You know, a single patient says something and then it just suddenly everything gets put into place. And I just think this goes along with all these other things that other people have said. And this must be a common theme. Now, this one patient we had uh, had been implanted elsewhere. He had unilateral deafness. And this is before the FDA had approved um, cochlear implants for unilateral deafness. But they implanted him, him, him for the purpose of tinnitus. Um, but his tinnitus didn't get better with the standard sort of implant programming. So they sent the patient to my colleague, Feng Ying Zhang's lab, to try to figure out if there's a way that we can actually make the tinnitus go away. So we first, we had a couple of uh, PhD students who have spent months with him. Uh, he would come down from Northern California every couple of weeks or, or so and spend a couple of days with us. And they found actually at a very low stimulation rate um, they were, that, that usually an implant can't do, and they, they used a, a research interface, that they could actually make the tinnitus go away completely in him. And they published some very nice studies uh, with electrophysiology when this tinnitus was silenced and when it was active. It's actually pretty cool. Then that made us think, you know, could we target these neurons, you know, with sound? Uh, because if people still have hearing, we may be able to target the neurons. So that then actually started uh, the process where my colleague, uh, Fang Gang Zeng, um, developed a, uh, a device called Sound Cure at the time. This was a the, the device that was dispensed by audiologists, but unfortunately sort of is now, now not on the market. And now I at the time thought, you know, can we get this, you know, can we figure this out remotely for people? Because what we found this stimulus around this, the frequency of the tinnitus is sort of what helps the most. So we then developed a software that was sort of web-based. People could connect, could match their tinnitus. And we showed that that was just as accurate as doing it in, in an office. And then we actually kind of did a rough test of hearing online, which was actually the, the first time that, you know, had been done. But what we realized is we don't have to have calibration. We just need to know relatively you know, what's their low frequency, what's their high frequency, what's their mid frequency range approximately, and their relationships to each other rather than the actual uh, sound level. And then the software actually create a sound therapy where it would give them certain sound around the frequency of the tinnitus, but it was a kind of a narrow band noise. So it wasn't as harsh as the tinnitus sound. So just a kind of a background for audience. If you actually, if somebody has a tinnitus at let's say 8,000 Hertz, you give them 8,000 hertz sound to hear, that will temporarily make their tinnitus go away in most of the people who have tinnitus. So, uh, or let's say at that frequency, for example. So, but that's obviously doesn't make any sense to listen to the same sound that they're hearing internally. So we then widened the frequency band a little bit around it, and then we gave them another couple other frequency bands that made it, so that it makes it sound more like white noise, but there was, those frequency bands were actually mathematically related because the way that the auditory cortex is organized is the sounds for 8,000 hertz, I'm sorry, the neurons for 8,000 hertz are right next to the 4,000 hertz, which are next to the 2,000, et cetera. So every octave you come down, every half uh, of that number, is those cells are right next to each other. So we then gave them these sounds, and we found that actually that worked better than, than generic sound when we did a clinical trial that we did a randomized crossover uh, design. But then after a while, we thought, you know, just again, seeing a lot of patients with tinnitus, I thought, this isn't solving the problem. I know we, we can reduce the volume, can reduce the impact, but we're not solving the problem. These people have a lot of stress-related stuff and whatnot. So we actually developed a, an internet-based cognitive behavioral therapy for these people. And we did a trial of that that was actually very effective. And then we actually did a trial combining cognitive behavioral therapy online and sound therapy online, uh, customized sound therapy. And that actually had a, a pretty big effect. Actually, the, the effect of that is, is similar to to some of the, the new sort of emerging devices that are on the market currently in terms of reducing the, the tinnitus functional index and, and the volume and whatnot. Then what I, in this interim, I realized, you know, that migraine is a big process uh, that's related to tinnitus. So then we actually incorporated the migraine education into our cognitive behavioral therapy so that people can, can get that information through that. Then I was still kind of hungry for a cure because I thought we're making the volume a little bit better, but we're not curing it. We need to find a cure. And so we actually, back in 2006, when I started at UC Irvine, when I got the IRB approval for our uh, sound therapy studies, I actually also included electric stimulation of the cochlea because that I thought that, that we should be able to make that work somehow. Now, it took some time and, and sort of collaboration with my hearing scientist colleague and, and my uh, neurotology colleague, Harrison Lin, 
And we were able to design the study using um, a sort of the yingling electrode the, you know, that we use in, in surgery for facial nerve stimulation in skull based cases that, that has a very small ball electrode. And what we did is we actually made an incision in the tympanic membrane and passed the electrode into the round window and stimulated the round window directly. And we found that actually we can make the tinnitus completely silent in patients, in not everyone, of course, but majority patients. But um, at a level where most of the time these patients either did not hear the electric stimulation, meaning they didn't hear a sound from it, or they habituated to the sound stim from the from the stimulus because the stimulus, of course, is going to go through neurons, so it's going to generate a little bit of sound. But they tend to habituate to that. But then the tinnitus also came down, and we had one patient who had several hours of residual inhibition. This is a patient who had 20 years of tinnitus. At like she had a 60 dB hearing loss, and we could make her tinnitus go away for several hours with just a five minute stimulation. Which then thought we thought, okay, this is what this is what we should be sort of focusing on. How can we get a device into the middle ear that could do this? And you know, the the challenge is always, you know, whenever I've thought about devices for for the ear, I always thought I want to make this a device that that all otolaryngologists can place, not something that just otologists can place, because Again, you're going to reach that bottleneck of only 300 people who can do the surgery in the country. And then, you know, you have, again, millions of people who could benefit from this. So we kind of went a little bit a different route than traditional devices, which, which are implanted under the skin and have an electrode that go into the middle ear. Our device actually is all contained in the middle ear, and there's an ear canal component that charges it up. So there's no sort of implanted battery in the same system that a coil from a cochlear implant can do the power transfer. This does a power transfer using a very tiny coil. And so now we've kind of, in the, towards the end of uh, the design and fabrication of the, the internal implant, which would be in the middle ear, which is basically a receiver and some uh, custom designed chips that then take the, the signal, translate it into a, an electric signal, and then can translate, put that into the round window. And then there is an ear canal component that that's sending the signal and the power. And then there's a handheld component that the patient will use for, for settings and or can be programmed by a, um, you know, the audiologist or whoever. So that's sort of uh, something we're doing. Now, in parallel, I know that a colleague that you and I both know and, and loved, uh, Matt Carlson in uh, Mayo Clinic's also doing a similar thing, but his device is implanted under the skin and goes onto the promontory of the cochlea and stimulates the uh, cochlea as well. They are in actually human trials. Uh, I don't know how many patients they've done so far, but uh, that holds promise uh, as well. It's using the similar idea as what we do. It's just ours is going to be hopefully something that any otolaryngologist can place without the need to do facial recess um, and things like that. Yeah, though th th that's uh, that's great to have, you know, an option that, you know, something that like the transcranial uh, magnetic treatment, you know, they would, it work, but then once you, you know, it would, would stop the therapy, a lot of times it wasn't lasting. So something like this would be something you can continually do. And so with your device, you just raise a tympanometal flap and, and place the device in and put the flap back down. So pretty straightforward operation. That is correct. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the, the hope and goal. we We've been able to keep the device at a pretty small dimension. There isn't a lot of room in the middle ear, um, as you know, uh, you know, especially the malleus between the malleus and the promontory is only about two and a half millimeters. In Fearly, there is more space, of course. And so our device is going to kind of fit within the confines of the middle ear the way it's currently designed and fabricated. Great. Have you had any experience with like the linear device or we're not part of their initial release yet, so I don't have a lot of experience. I do have patients calling. Can you tell us about your experience with uh, the linear device? Yeah, so linear, and I, I know uh, the founder, Hubert Lim, is an incredibly intelligent you know, researcher, and we actually really tried very hard to recruit him to come to UCI. Anyway, so he they, uh, that device, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great idea. I think there are probably a small subset of patients that do get benefit from it. You know, I'm a little bit biased because I, I see all the failures, of course. Um, so all the patients I see are the ones who didn't get benefit. You know, the ones who do get benefit, they don't necessarily come to see me. Now, you know, I think considering that we know now, at least our understanding of what makes tinnitus loud is really the central sensitivity phenomenon that migraine creates that causes the brain to pay attention to that signal. Um, that is not really addressed with a device like the linear. Now, 
is the linear device is, is sending some trigeminal stimulation in effect by stimulating the tongue. I don't know if that, that stimulation is enough to have an effect. The, you know, the tongue was primarily chosen based on the animal experiments that were done initially. But, you know, I don't know if, you know, if how much of the effect is from people sitting quietly for 30 minutes twice a day and not doing anything other than sort of just relaxing. You know, I think if you have a lot of patients with tinnitus, just, you know, listen to, let's say, just sound therapy and, you know, relax for an hour a day, that, that would have a pretty significant effect on their tinnitus as well. You know, how much of that is, is more than the, the sound and relaxation? I don't really know. I would have liked to have seen the trials be done a little bit differently with maybe a paddle that, that doesn't stimulate. So p- patients are doing exactly the same thing and, you know, and maybe using just a, a generic sound like white noise, you know, that's, that's sort of not for me to decide sort of how their trials should be done. But, the, but you know, as, as far as, you know, does it have an effect? I think there are some people who do get benefit. How much of that benefit is from, from, you know, one component versus the other? I don't know. I think they are, you know, just knowing Dr. Lim, he's such an incredibly intelligent uh, person. He's working on other devices as well. So I think, you know, that that may not be necessarily their final device. There may be newer iterations that potentially may be more effective. We currently don't offer it either, partly because we're just so successful with what we're doing, you know, for the fluctuating tinnitus patients and the ones who've changed levels. But at the same time, we do use um, customized sound therapy. It's a lot more affordable than, than the device, which tends to be somewhat expensive. We use sound therapy, yes. Do we use hearing aids? Yes. I mean, if someone has significant hearing loss, using hearing aids is going to be a benefit to them because the more sound you get to the brain, the quieter the brain cells are going to kind of, uh, be. And so therefore the tinnitus is going to be quieter. But, you know, of course, hearing aids can help when there's no sound around. So that's why they need some kind of sound therapy. So we sort of combine them usually together. Great. Well, Amit, it looks like we're getting close to needing to wrap up. Is there anything else you'd like to tell the audience? No, I think, you know, one thing I, I want people to take away from this is that tinnitus is actually now treatable. There are ways we can reduce the volume. I think in the past, we used to sort of have a lot of people would tell patients there's nothing that could be done and that there's nothing worse than, than that for telling a patient because the patients get very depressed because a lot of these patients at this, especially initial onset, are very distressed by it. And the ones with fluctuation, it takes away their sort of the predictability of it. And so then they they just can't, they, they because when they have a really bad day, they can't do anything and they don't know when those bad days are coming. But now what we've been able to do is actually been able to identify what causes the bad days. And the patients are now, they're more in control of the tinnitus. So even if they have a bad night of sleep and the tinnitus is increased, they don't stress about it and cause it to be a multi-day terrible day of, you know, multi-day uh, as of bad tinnitus. It's usually say, they say, okay, well, I know it's because of the bad sleep. It's going to settle down today. I'm just going to be more careful with my diet today. I'm going to make sure I don't stress out. And then they get through it and they get better, you know, by the evening or something. So it, it's brought a lot more control to the patient. We're able to reduce fluctuations. So, you know, I ask the audience to please don't tell patients there's nothing that can be done because there are things that can be done. And those are things that you you can do. And, and if you don't feel comfortable, there are, you know, other people or other, you know, as I said, the telemedicine clinic can, can help patients settle the tinnitus for them as best as can be done. Well, I want the audience to know that the links to many of the topics uh, and devices we talked about today are available on the show notes. Well, thank you so much for your time, uh, you know, talking about this very difficult topic you know, it's really encouraging here. There's many um, new treatment options, some that are simple enough as we talked about diet, supplementation, some medications, and then these other um, sort of treatments you, you're working on. So really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I really appreciate you making the time to allow me to sort of speak to the audience about this. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Aaron Bowles, Josh McWhorter, and Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. 
administrative support provided by Judy Delacruz. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.